Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today, we continue our review of the book Eurasianism, an ideology for the multipolar world. In our previous meeting, we underlined the importance of Gumilyov as an author that links and combines classic Eurasianism with neo-Eurasianism. And today, we will describe the main features from a theoretical point of view that uh, comprise the doctrine of neo-Eurasianism. First, we will give an historical background of the phenomenon from its appearance to its development. Then we will analyze the key conceptual components of this doctrine. And finally, we will introduce the two core contemporary authors that have been the uh, epitomization of this philosophical doctrine. So first of all, we have to understand that from an historical perspective, neo-Eurasianism can be situated in the context of the disappearance of the Soviet Union. And many historians, political scientists, and uh, um, historians of civilization have understood the demise of the Soviet Union as the consequence of two main forces. First of all, the treason, the inner treason of its inner elites. And secondly, some uh, plots of the international forces of Atlanticism against the Soviet Union. Culturally speaking, and from a civilizational standpoint, the demise of the Soviet Union represented the negation of Russia's imperial nature and its derating into a second grade international power within the international system. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the end of the Warsaw Pact uh, which of course then led also to the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself, introduced the so-called unipolar phase of the international system, the unipolar world, uh, with the United States of America as the only superpower left. This event, the introduction of the unipolar world, led to the humiliation, was perceived as a humiliation by uh, many Russian citizens or Soviet citizens. And this in turn led to a renewal of those philosophical currents that auspicated a return to the past glory that ended up with 1991. To some extent, 1991 represented for the Russians what 1919, as the, incarnated by the Treaty of Versailles, represented for Germany. Uh, in this sense, neo-Eurasianism appeared as an ideology oriented towards an imperial reconstruction with a strong anti-Western and anti-Atlanticist component, because it saw in the West and in Atlanticism the forces that had destroyed the Soviet Empire. Uh, however, neo-Eurasianism cannot be considered as an anti-globalization theory, but rather as an alter globalization theory. Uh, why? Because basically it wishes to offer a new paradigm based upon cultural diversity, ethnic identity, and multipolarity against a globalized unilateral um, international model. Therefore, essentially, neo-Eurasianism is a theory of the multipolar world, is par excellence the theory of the multipolar world. And according to this theory, the world is divided into different civilizational big spaces, each one which is with its own characteristics and features that cannot be overcome by globalization or unilinear globalism. Each of these spheres of civilization is conceived as unique and worthy of being preserved and safeguarded on equal footing. Uh, this idea of the civilizational model was borrowed by uh, Neurasianism. Uh, Neurasianism borrowed this model from uh, the assimilation of the thought 
of important historians and sociologists like Max Weber, uh, Arnold J. Toynbee, but also Oswald Spengler, Fernand Brodel, and more broadly, the French Annal School of Historiography. We have to remember that in the mid 1980s, the Soviet society was beginning to lose a satisfactory interaction with the external environment and with itself. This idea of self-sustainable society that was the Soviet model was starting to fall apart. Different strata of society felt a need for change. However, they still did not understand fully how and where this change should occur. And in this context, in the context of this uncertainty and of this social uh, sense of insecurity, different political and philosophical forces began to appear, which split Soviet society into several parts. There were the so-called forces of progress that faced the forces of uh, reaction, the reformers faced the conservators of the past, and the partisans of reforms faced the enemies of reforms. Now, the idea of introducing reforms was actually based on the will to import in the Soviet Union the main aspects of liberal democratic countries. In other words, the promoters of the reformation of society implicitly admitted the superiority of the Western liberal democratic model and the necessity to imitate it in the Soviet Union. And therefore, those who strived for introducing this liberal democratic reforms and liberal economic reforms became the unconditional supporters of the West, of capitalism, and also of NATO expansion and of NATO interaction with the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the opponents of reforms embodied those who wished to endorse the continuation of the existence of the Soviet Union as a socialist experiment, uh, the continuation of the Warsaw Pact as a collective defense security mechanism against NATO, and of course the promoters of real socialism. Now the pro-Western elites who wished to introduce liberal reforms had on their side a potential novelty and will of modernizing that, for instance, the anti-Westerners did not possess. This anti-Westerners based their paradigms on old schemes that were not new and were not uh, interesting for uh, this new epoch that was going towards post-communism. Uh, and this aspect allowed liberal democratic policies and liberal democratic political forces to prevail at the time of uh, perestroika and at the time of reforms in the 1990s. Now, the reconstruction of the Soviet political and economic system resulted ultimately in the collapse of the Soviet state itself and the formation of post-Soviet national entities highly influenced by nationalism, because like it had occurred and it was occurring in Yugoslavia, uh, nationalism was the ideology that replaced the glue that kept together the state that was socialism. So nationalism replaced socialism and uh, it became the driving force for the independence or the struggle for independence of the nations that were once bound within the socialist state. However, soon after the adoption of Western economic and social models during uh, Boris Yeltsin's presidency, the Russian society began to understand that the liberal democratic paradigm was something alien to Russia's historical development and mentality. In other words, Russia had to choose between two variants. One was to turn into a westernized state, uh, forgetting its own past and rejecting uh, its own historical specific uh, model, or it could reject 
this model, this liberal democratic model that could not satisfy its real spiritual and cultural needs. And in this context, an anti-Western and anti-liberal opposition began to form, which took the shape of variegated national patriotic opposition, including part of the Soviet conservatives, groups of reformers disappointed with reforms, or having become conscious of their anti-state direction, and also groups of representatives of the patriotic movements, which uh, wish to shape the sentiment of state power, not in the sense of communism, but rather in the sense of nationalism or uh, mon monarchism uh, espousing orthodoxy. And so within the context of post-Soviet patriotism, neo-Eurasianism arose as an ideological and political phenomenon that gradually turned into one of the main directions of the newly reborn Russian patriotic self-consciousness. Now, analyzing in depth the Eurasianist parallel paradigm as a philosophical political doctrine, we can say, first of all, that from a theoretical standpoint, Neo-Eurasianism renews the classic principles of the early Eurasianist movement that we analyzed in some previous videos, transforming them into the foundations of an ideological and political program that wished to challenge the current unipolar globalized world. And so the heritage of the classic Eurasianists was adopted as the fundamental Feltanschauung for the political and ideological struggle against the forces of post-liberalism, mondialism, and Atlanticism as espoused by the West. Neo-Eurasianism founds its conceptual framework on basically two core criticisms. On one hand, there is the idea of the rejection of the West. Uh, the rejection of the West is a criticism towards the Western bourgeois capitalist and individualist society, both from a social left-wing perspective and also from a civilizational right-wing perspective. The second criticism refers to the so-called Roman German civilization that New Eurasianist considers the Anglo-Saxon world to be the continuer, which would claim, according to this narrative, uh, to possess the right to a universal uh, paradigm, to universally impose its civilizational paradigm, considering itself intrinsically superior to other civilizational paradigms. Thus being, thus being the only paradigm that is considered to be valuable and worth following. Now for neo-Eurasianists also there is the importance of the spatial factor of the importance of geography, for interpreting history and the understanding of the unfolding civilizations. History, according to Neo-Eurasianism, is interpreted through the models of cycles, the cyclical models, which is typical of those long-term schemas of the history of civilizations. Now, this geographical anthropological approach, um, which directly links peoples to soil and hinges on ethnographic and cultural frames is assimilated by Neo-Eurasianism from the works of very important historians of civilizations, including Nikolai Danilevsky, Oswald Spengler, and Arnold Toynbee, and Liev Gumilyov, as we have seen in the previous video. Now, of course, the Neo-Eurasianist doctrine is um, finds an, a, a pivotal a pivotal element on the idea, idea of traditionalism. Uh, traditionalism is one of the core aspects of the Neo-Eurasianist doctrine. Now, in terms of historical dynamism, traditionalist philosophy denies the idea of evolution and of linear progress. Instead, it replaces these ideas with the theories of cosmic cycles of the multiple states of the being and also of sacred geography. In other words, whereas the Western paradigm implies uh, a linear 
a linear evolution for the historical development and unfolding of events, Eurasianism believes in cyclical schemes that comprise the idea of a return, a cyclical return to the past, which also represents the present and the future. In other words, there is no present, past and future, but there is a cyclical uh, a cyclical representation of reality and of the historical evolution. Now, the elementary principles of the theory of cycles were postulated by the French esotericist, esotericist uh, René Guénon, uh, and also other traditionalist intellectuals contributed in shaping this specific mentality. For instance, Gaston Georgel, Titus Burkhardt, Mircea Eliade, Henry Corbin. And in the context of the theory of cycles, the history of Russia is conceived as the incarnation of a spatial cyclical system opposed to the temporal unilinear Western one that goes from one point to another uh, following a, a linear direction. From a point of view of historiography, Neo-Eurasianism follows a pattern that unveils the continuity of Russian historical evolution, which is divided specifically into several stages. Uh, this idea of um, stages, different stages of Russianist historiography is construed following the hermeneutical tools of Nikolai Ustryalov's national Bolshevik ideology and its conceptual development by Mikhail Agursky. According to this general frame, the first stage is that of Kievan Rus, from the 9th to the 13th centuries, which is perceived as the appearance of Russian future national identity, thanks to its closeness with the Byzantine Orthodox civilization. The successive phase is the phase of the Mongolian Tatar domination from the 13th to the 15th centuries, which contributed uh, to separating the uh, Russian evolution to that of the other European countries. Uh, in fact, during the Mongol rule, the division between the Western and Eastern Russians occurred, and the latter became the cradle from which the so-called great Russians would emerge under the control of the, the Golden Horde. Then the third stage comprises the foundation of the Moscovite principality and its unification of Russian states under a single political entity from the 15th to the 17th centuries. Uh, during the Moscovite rise, three main historical events occurred. First, Moscow acquired a religious mission as defender of the Christian Orthodox faith, gaining the title of Third Rome after the conquer of Constantinople by the Ottoman Empire in 1453. Secondly, the rulers annexed uh, other Russian principalities unifying Russia, Rus, and finally, the country expanded eastwards through Siberia, conquering the Tatar and Siberian Kaganates, and ultimately reaching the Pacific shores and Alaska. Then the fourth period was that of the so-called Roman-German yoke. Uh, why yoke? Because it was embodied by a dynasty, the Romanov, from the late 17th to the early 20th centuries that opened Russia to the West and to Western reforms. The Romanov rulers are perceived by Neo-Eurasianism historiography as guilty of having forcibly westernized Russian society, importing cultural, civilizational, and behavioral models from Western European countries, thus betraying Russian true nature and historical identity. And then the successive phase after the Romanov yoke was that of the Bolshevik revolution and the establishment of the Soviet rule from 1917 through to 1991. This peculiar phase of Russian history is perceived in Eurasianist ideology somewhat positively. Because though Marx's general ideological and social, social economic scheme is rejected by Neo Eurasianism, still, Neo Eurasianists believe that the Soviet era resulted in a revenge 
of the Russian popular masses against the Western dominant elite and in a rediscovery of the genuine Eurasian geopolitical tradition of Russia. And this was exemplified, epitomized by the shift of the capital city once again in Moscow, uh, rather than in St. Petersburg, uh, Leningrad. A similar event has a, had occurred more or less at the same, in the same time uh, in the, the Turkey after the demise of the Ottoman Empire and after the victorious war of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, when he decided similar, in a similar vein to shift the capital city from Istanbul to uh, Ankara. And then the final phase of this Russian historiography is that of contemporary post-Soviet Russia, which according to the neo-Eurasianist understanding uh, should eventually end with the overcoming of the unipolar globalist model of world, the spread of a worldwide conservative revolution and the final establishment of the multipolar civilizational world. Now, in terms of the political platform, neo-Eurasianism appears on one hand as a conservative and traditionalist movement, but also on the other hand, it appears as an egalitarian collectivist and socialist movement. And indeed, as a unique blend, it borrows ideological features that belong both to the far right, we would say today populist far right, sovereignist far right, and to the far left political spectrum, combining them in the attempt to oppose what is considered the core enemy, that is Western post-liberalism, characterized by some specific features, like for instance, the logics of individualism, consumerism, egoism, cultural imperialism, and unilinear globalism, as well as uh, veiled neo-colonialism. And as an ideology, neo-Eurasianism uses the methodology, for instance, of the elitist doctrine. The elitist doctrine that go, goes back to Wilfredo Pareto's school of political science, but also it moves within the logic of the rehabilitation of organic natural hierarchy, both at a social level and also at a family level and also at a, at a, at a state level. Also, it picks up some motifs that are dear to the uh, philosophical thought of Nietzsche. It also develops a specific doctrine of the ontology of power. And also it has, it bears a specific concept that comes from the Christian Orthodox tradition. That is the concept of power known as katechon, which means basically uh, in Greek, though that, that who holds the force, in other words, implicitly the force that holds the forces of evil to uh, unfold, that blocks the forces of evil, it stops them. This is the concept of power as katechon. As we already said, the elitist doctrine is widely accepted by neo rationalism And according to the uh, elitist doctrine, with Pareto, Michels, and so on, uh, individuals who form an elite are those whose influence, capacities, qualities, or authority in society is greater than that of others. And this condition would make them fit to govern. Uh, among the main um, uh, theorizers of um, uh, elitism, we can quote Gaetano Mosca, Wilfredo Pareto and Robert Michels, all equally respected and analyzed in New Eurasianist doctrine. Moreover, uh, New Eurasianism wholly adheres to the foundations of traditionalist philosophy, assimilating the works of uh, extremely important philosophers such as René Guénon, Julius Ebola, Henry Corbin, Titus Burkhardt, Oswald Spengler, Georges Dumézil, Louis Dumont. And in fact, one of the main theoretical postulates borrowed from traditionalist philosophy is the idea of the radical decay of the so-called, quote unquote, modern world. 
And so the global concept of the modern world is perceived as a negative category and as the antithesis of the so-called positive category of, quote unquote, world of tradition, tradition with capital T. And this dialectic interpretation justifies also from a metaphysical and a scatological point of view, the criticism uh, of the Western Atlanticist civilization, defining the eschatological, critical and fatal content of the fundamental, fundamentally destructive processes that would originate from the West against the world of conservatism and of tradition. Also, uh, in the neo regionist doctrine, a special place is held by anthropological studies, specifically those carried out by Carl Jung, but also Claude Levi Strauss. And uh, also, New Eurasianism pays a lot of attention to the origins of sacredness, religiosity, archaic initiation rites, myths, customary habits of different ethnic groups. Uh, also, uh, semiology, symbolism are considered important tools for interpreting the hidden mysteries of human civilizations. And for instance, in this regard, Eurasianism considers extremely interesting and important the expeditions and discoveries made, for instance, by the German Hanenerbe, uh, and specifically, for instance, Hermann Wirth's paleoepigraphic findings in Sweden uh, or uh, elsewhere in the expeditions of this organization. In other words, linguistic, epigraphic, runologic, mythological, and folkloric studies are utilized by Neo-Eurasianism for demonstrating the existence of common Eurasian ancestral roots that are deeply important and meaningful. Also concerning the history, language, and religion of Indo-Europeans, there is an utter interest in the discovery of these roots by Neo-Eurasianism. Uh, the Indo-European society is studied from many points of views, but not only the Indo-European one. Uh, an interest, a specific interest, goes also is paid uh, towards the, the Turanian uh, civilizations, the Ural Altaic civilization, uh, including the linguistical and ethnic aspects of these big families. On one hand, Indo-European family; on the other hand, Ural Altaic or Turanian uh, family. Also, there, is, there are some themes that are dear to Neo-Eurasianism that refer to sacred geography, to ethnography, to mythology, to paleography. And also a very important aspect is that given by esotericism. Uh, there are some myths, specific Eurasian myths that are considered of utter importance for the understanding of the world. These include, for instance, uh, Madame Blavatsky's theosophy, but also the Tibetan myth of Shambhala or Shangri-La, but also the legend of the king of the world as analyzed thoroughly by René Guénon, as well as the myth of Agarthi, but also the chronicles of the Hyperboreans and so on. Generally speaking, Neo-Eurasianism rejects the principle of representative democracy in favor of that of organic or functional democracy as theorized, for instance, by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Karl Schmitt, Julian Freund, Arthur Müller van den Broek, and also Alain de Benoit. Uh, the term used by Neo-Eurasianists for uh, expressing the idea of organic democracy is demotia, which would replace the ordinary term democracy, indicating precisely a direct participation of the people in their own destiny and political fate. Furthermore, a specific attention is given to the revaluation of the role of ideologies to the theory of ideocracy, which indicates the foundational socio-political power of ideologies against the post-ideological, economic, and market-oriented globalist framework. In this sense, the elements that neo-Eurasianism counts in order to mold the new homo politicus, which should oppose and contrast homo economicus, 
are uh, essentially borrowed from the ideologies of conservatism, traditionalism, collectivism, corporativism, and national Bolshevism. Now, also, neo-Eurasianist thought comprises a fundamental geopolitical component. And indeed, neo-Eurasianists reconsider the main classic geopolitical theories of the 20th century that concern Eurasia. Uh, these theories include the works, as we'll see better in successive videos, the works of Halford Mackinder, specifically the Heartland theory, but also the idea of the continental bloc strategy espoused by Karl Haushofer, and also the pan-regional worldview, both uh, espoused by Haushofer and Hjellen, uh, as well as Nicholas Spikeman's Rimland theory, Karl Schmidt's dialectical model of sea power against land power, uh, Jean Thiriard's pan-Eurasian project, and so on. Now, specifically, thanks to McKinder's geopolitical analysis, which contributed to defining the strategic roles of the heartland, the world island, and the inner and outer crescents, the term Eurasia acquired a fundamental geopolitical meaning. In this sense, Eurasianism began to indicate the continental configuration of a strategic block created around Russia, or at least the heartland holder, uh, and antagonistic to the strategic initiatives of the opposite geopolitical pole of Atlanticism, which has been headed since the mid 20th century by the United States, outplacing uh, the previous uh, leader, which was Great Britain. Now, many classic geopolitical theories seek to explain the strategic relevance of Eurasia and the historical antagonism between the Thalassocratic West and the Tellurocratic East. For instance, during the 19th century, the two major Eurasian empires of the time, uh, namely Great Britain and Russia, that is a sea power and a continental power respectively, uh, struggled for imperial hegemony over Eurasia in what was then called the Great Game. The Great Game may be considered a veiled challenge chiefly between Britain and Russia that implied a watchful use of diplomacy, intelligence, and counterintelligence to win over the rival. Now, during the Second World War, the relevance of controlling Eurasia in order to gain pan-regional hegemony led, for instance, Germany to the invasion of the Russian core land. After the, world, the war, through the birth of the bipolar world uh, during the Cold War, um, with the United States, predominantly sea power, confronting the Soviet Union, a predominantly land power, the quest for global hegemony was still concentrated on the need to contain the Soviet influence and expansion over Eurasia, on one hand, and to break the American and NATO encirclement on the other, on the side of the Soviet Union. And even today, as we speak, as of today, uh, as the Ukrainian war is currently shown, the United States and the European Union conceive strategies aimed at containing Russia's influence in Ukraine, in this case, avoiding it to reach, for instance, a strategic position in the Mediterranean Sea, whereas Russia tends instead to project its authority more intensively over its post-Soviet sphere of influence over the Balkans uh, and also in the Caucasus region, clashing against the interests of NATO and of the EU. Now, we have to understand that Russia has always suffered, Russian mentality has always suffered from the disease of considering the country encircled or even besieged. And President, US President Truman, uh, after the Second World War, introduced, as we know, a containment strategy which was originally elaborated in February 1946 by the diplomat George Kennan in the long telegram, uh, and the deployment of NATO or US troops across the Soviet borders. This containment strategy, of course, further nourished the Russian phobia of encirclement, with the inclusion, for instance, of countries within NATO like Greece or Turkey. 
Now, historically, the Tsarist Empire had continuously expanded into both the Heartland and the Rimland. And this thrust was justified by the Russian need to obtain an outlet to the so-called warm seas that would allow, of course, the continuation of trade during the winter, despite the glaciation of the Arctic Sea. This result was Russia's territorial expansion towards the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, the Caspian Sea, and the Yellow Sea. And during the 19th century, the British Empire considered Russia's enlargement as threatening, mainly because it could interpose or shatter the British communication lines with the Indian Raj. And then so Great Britain began to contain Russian power. And this containment often led to the outbreak of conflicts. Think for instance of the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. And when this uh, Russian British antagonism for the control over Eurasia shifted towards Central Asia, challenging British India with Russian Turkestan, a struggle for Eurasian hegemony became evident at that time. Later, during the Cold War, the United States replaced Imperial Britain in containing the Russian power, in this case, the Soviet Union's power throughout several areas of the Rimland, that is the marginal uh, areas of Eurasia. At the same time, the Soviet Union attempted to break this US NATO encirclement, as it was perceived uh, by Moscow, in Europe, the Middle East and the Far East. But today we're still living through similar geopolitical trends because old international actors reappear under different names, but still they confront each other for the same geopolitical purpose of gaining hegemony over the Eurasian landmass in what we may consider a new great game in the last decades. And now today, this confrontation implies issues that are related to uh, NATO and EU enlargement, energetic supplies, the rise of the so-called BRICS economies or countries, and also the Chinese potential alignment with Russia. Uh, now, this the appearance of a multipolar global order would pass through the struggle between the declining unipolar status quo and the upsurge of new power centers that could question the Atlanticist hegemonic role in international relations. Within this frame, we have to understand that the Eurasian continent and specifically its European, Balkan, Caucasian and Middle Eastern reams embodies one of the main battlefields in which today, in the 21st century, the balance of power, the international balance of power will be forged and is being forged. Also, this area will be the ultimate ordeal that will establish whether uh, we will live in the future, all of us, whether we will live both in, a, we will live either in, a, still in a unipolar world led by the US and its allies, or if the shift of power will go towards the Eurasian and Asian powers in the frame of a multipolar world. And this in terms of the geopolitics that underline the uh, discourse within the Eurasianist doctrine. Another fundamental aspect and aim of the neo eurasianist theory is that of striving to assimilate the social criticism of the so-called new left into a conservative right-wing interpretation. What does this entail? Well, first of all, a matter reconsideration of the philosophical heritage of philosophers like Michel Foucault or Gilles Deleuze. And criticism towards the bourgeois Western model connects neo-Eurasianism to positions that are typical of anarchism, neo-Marxism, and of the left-wing interpretation of anti-globalism. Finally, to conclude this general uh, overview of uh, the core aspects, theoretical aspects of neo-Eurasianism, we can say that from a point of view of economics, neo-Eurasianism adheres to a peculiar third-way vision, 
which is alternative both to the liberal and communist model and is based on a mix of public intervention and private initiative and also on a heterodox set of economic principles that include the idea of an economic outer key of the great spaces. This idea is taken by Carl Schmidt. He called them at the time Grossräume. Uh, also the adoption of Friedrich List's theory of the Solverein, that is the custom union, and also on the actualization of the economic theories by Silvio Gesell, Josef Schumpeter, and François Perroux. Also, finally, there is this idea of a specific Eurasianist reading of uh, Keynes, Keynes' theories on macroeconomic intervention and state intervention uh, to uh, overcome structural macroeconomic crises. After this general introduction, let's consider the two contemporary main theorizers of neo-Eurasianism, namely Alexander Panarin and then Alexander Dugin. First of all, starting with Alexander Panarin, uh, he was born in 1940 and died in 2003 and can be considered one of the main ideologues of the neo-Eurasianist movement. Let's quote some of his main works. First of all, there is Philosophia Politici, philosophy, philosophy of politics, there, this is, was published in 1996. Then there is the Revanche History, the Revenge of History, 1998. Uh, the Global Political Forecasting and the Conditions of Strategic Instability. That was published in 2000. There is also Politologia, Omire Politik Navostoki na Zapadie, Political Science on World Politics and in the East and the West, 2000. The Global Political Forecast, that was published in 2001. The Temptation of Globalism, 2002. Orthodox Civilization in a Global World, 2002. Let's consider some of the core aspects of Panarin's thought. First of all, in considering Russia's history, Panarin believed that the geographical historical inclinations of the country led it towards the adoption of an imperial regime. Uh, Panarin was an, a supporter of Russian imperialism. He was himself a somewhat imperialist. For him, uh, Russia represented the world's leading driving force for the consolidation of an alternative model to uh, Western globalization. And in adherence with the idea of Russia's messianic mission to counter the uh, US-led or Western-led globalization model, Panarin believed that thanks to Russia's ultra-globalization forces, humanity would manage to overcome the Western model. And following the frame of classical Eurasianism, the intellectual matrix of Panarin's neo-Eurasianist thought uh, is founded on the rejection of the West, which is perceived as responsible for all of Russia's illnesses, and also the main factor that leads humanity towards destruction. For instance, in his, in his work, Pravoslavnaya Civilizatsia, which represents a spiritual response to the unrestrained forms of technological development and to the secularization of Western societies, uh, Panarin depicts the Western European model as hinging on the principles of capitalism, hedonism, consumerism, rationalism, materialism, and what he calls democratic racism. And Panarin opposed the Western self-imputed universality, claiming that Eurocentrism represented a new form of colonization of other civilizations through the logic of unilateral development and cultural hierarchy under the uh, umbrella of democracy, liberal democracy, as a tantra to justify neo-colonialism. Also, Panarin interestingly made a difference between Occidentalism, that is Zapatnichestva, and Westernization, Westernizatia. Now, the first term, Occidentalism, indicated the constitutive elements of the European philosophical heritage, that is, liberalism, 
the idea of rule of law, democratic regime, legalism, and constitutionalism. On the other hand, Westernization held a strongly negative connotation in Panarin's lexicon, being characterized basically by negative aspects like savage capitalism and financialism, social decline, moral decay, and also a blind imitation of a Western lifestyle considered morally um, despicable. Westernization did not affect all European countries, but some of them featured both phenomena, especially in Northern Europe and Western Europe. Uh, and Panarin also perceived an opposition between two idiosyncratic Europes. There is on one hand, in, according to him, an Atlanticist universalistic Europe that upheld the Roman idea, and on the other one, a, a, a national continental one perpetuating the German idea. Panarin, of course, made also use of geopolitical analysis, stating that Nicholas Spikeman's model of the Rimland could explain the rivalry between continental and maritime powers. He portrayed the Rimland as a contended European zone between the continental and the Atlantic spaces. And historically, the hegemons of both spaces have attempted to control it, according to Panarin, and to colonize it from a strategic and cultural point of view. Then Panarin believed that whereas other civilizations develop in a cyclical fashion, the Western one followed a linear conception of time and a narrow perception of historical development. We already said that uh, previously. He also argued that civilizations could not be reduced one to another, each one constituting a solid and closed structure based on different values that could not be traced back to the Western model. And as bearer of an unchangeable forms of social construction, each civilization would possess some unique features and its disappearance would impoverish all humankind. This was, of course, a critique against melting pot and against the destruction of societies following a globalist uh, unilinear model. Panaris thought was highly influenced by cultural relativism, and he claimed that nations could not judge others on qualitative terms, that not one single universal model existed, and that every civilization should have autonomously pursued uh, its way to modernity. Here we can see a lot of echo of Oswald Spengler's uh, works. Mm, he presented, Panarin presented uh, in, his works, the, in his works, the theme of the decline of the West as presented firstly by Spengler and also of the need for a radical refusal of the decaying Western system. Also, in Revanche Story, Panarin exposed his thesis against Francis Fukuyama's idea of the end of history, uh, believing that the liberal democratic paradigm had shown its extrinsic limits, and above all, its impossibility to be adopted on a universal scale. And also one of Panarin's main theoretical goals was to renovate civilizational consciousness among the peoples of the world. And civilizational consciousness as well as historical consciousness meant the awareness and acceptance of world's inherent diversity, different historical development, and also the spread of a conceptual paradigm alternative to the Western globalist one based on the idea of the destruction of identities. Also, Panarin theorized the new discipline of the so-called global political prognostication, which basically deals with two specific topics. On one hand, it studies globalization in its uh, historical dynamics, and on the other, instead, it analyzes the conditions for prognosticating a qualitatively different future. Uh, globalization is guilty according to Panarin, of having created a liberal democracy that is limited to a small group of privileged and extraterritorial people, while relegating the rest of humankind to low intensity conflicts and permanent ecocide. This is the term he uses. Also, Panarin's conception of civilization is based on the idea of plurality of history, which attempts to theorize possible alternatives to Western-led globalization responsible, according to Panarin, for the privatization of the world's future. 
Uh, in, uh, we can say, we can claim that Panaris' frame is somewhat closely related to Samuel Huntington's pattern of the clash of civilizations, because both espoused the idea of dividing the world into civilizational areas. Uh, Panarin's beliefs made him oppose the principles of European cosmopolitanism, as well as humanism and egalitarianism. For Panarin, the fatherland was conceived as the only entity that could provide access to universal certainties. However, instead of local ethnic regional homelands or of Western type nation states, Panarin emphasized the need for swearing obedience to a greater fatherland capable of creating a civilizational area, that is an empire. This is very clear. Uh, if we follow the same scheme adopted by Karl Schmidt in the idea of uh, das Reich, of empire, of Schmittian empire. Now, Spanarin postulated the existence of a third way, that is a just milieu, between the Western egalitarian universalism and ethnic particularism of the non-European world. That is the form of gross uh, realm espoused by imperial great space and civilizational block and area. Panarin also highlighted the mistakes of the industrial society, the failure of Western society. He also upheld the ecological argument in favor of anti-industrial societies. He was, of course, in favor of rural agricultural societies. And he advocated the revenge of the natural against the artificial, striving for the replacement of the logic of economics with uh, cultural and religious oriented values. In terms of Russia as a whole, Panarin presented it as a global safeguard of polycentrism, showing that uh, the West did not represent the sole driving force of development. And the adoption of the Western model represented a geopolitical and cultural death, according to Panarin, that contrasted with the true national interests and civilizational values of countries, including countries in Europe and in America. And according to Panarin, it would be valuable to reestablish the Eurasian dichotomy between West and East, rather than the false dilemma created by globalization of North of the world versus South. Generally speaking, Panarin opposed ethnic nationalism, uh, national chauvinism, and the model of nation state as emerged out of the French Revolution and uh, the, the evolution of the nation state in contemporary history. And he believed that the authenticity of Eurasia was based not on ethnic complementarity, but rather on the shared past of its peoples, on a common statehood, and on a united political imperial will. And Eurasian pluralism was to be conceived as civilization. Because while westernized Europe gave primacy to individual rights, for instance, pluralism for individuals, Eurasia upheld the idea of collective rights, be them regional, ethnic, or religious, recognizing the right of autonomy for all regions, nations, groups, and respecting the diversity of ways of life. So in this sense, Panarin replaced the principle of civilizational pluralism uh, with that replaced this, the principle replaced that of cultural individualism typical of the West. Also, as we already anticipated, Panarin supported the imperialistic idea. He believed that empires could be the only political systems capable of responding to the challenges of postmodern societies since they promoted a civilizational awareness, um, dividing the world along distinct regional and ethnic lines and providing an ideology of order and of hierarchy and of authority to use as a bulwark against the chaos of modern liberal societies. Also empires represented the political personification of the geographical extensions of Eurasia, legitimizing its natural unification as a pan-continent. And in other words, the imperial model was the natural response to Eurasia's national linguistic and religious diversities. The Eurasianist ideology would overcome all national and social differences, according to Panarin, 
inspired by this fundamental idea based on empire. And finally, uh, Panarin aspirated the birth of a hybrid political regime that combined market economy, a strong presidential administration, a modernizing economic nationalism, and conservative values, but also an official ideology, a bureaucracy, nationally minded intellectuals, and a strategic international partnership among imperial civilizational blocs. So this as much as Panarin is concerned. Now we will consider in the final part of this video, the other main theorizer of the neo-Eurasianist doctrine, that is Alexander Dugin, who was born in 1962. And of course, as of today, he is still alive and active. We can say that Dugin represents the maximum exponent of contemporary neo-Eurasianism. He wrote uh, a number, a conspicuous number of books and articles concerning Eurasianist issues and themes. And so he may be considered the intellectual founder of the neo-Eurasianist movement. Now, Dugan's publications began in the early 1990s, just after the demise of the Soviet Union and the birth of the new Russian Federation. First of all, he edited various journals like Elementi, Elements, Mili, Angel, Sweet Angel, Yevrasisko i Vtorzhenie, Eurasian Imposition, and Yevrasisko i Obozrenie, Eurasian Review. Uh, Dugan's thought is notably influenced by traditionalism, but also by occultism and by geopolitical theories that uh, claim, as we have already seen, the supremacy of the Eurasian continent for the purpose of uh, world power. Between 1985 and 1919, Dugan adhered to the right-winged version of neo-Eurasianism, closely linked to ultra-nationalist and conservative monarchic circles. And Dugan's ideas showed a clear inclination towards historical traditionalism with orthodox monarchic and ethnic uh, elements. At that time, uh, Dugan held seminars and lectures to various groups that belonged to the conservative patriotic social and political spectrum. And he criticized at the time the Soviet paradigm, accusing it of lacking the Russian genuine spiritual and nationalistic qualitative element. In the early 1990s, Dugan's books began to spread outside the Russian borders into Western countries. For instance, in 1989, Continente Russia, a Russian continent, appeared in Italy. And in 1990, Russia, Misterio de Eurasia, Russian mystery of Eurasia, appeared in Spain. In 1990, Dugan also commented on René Guénon's La crise du monde moderne, the crisis of the modern world and also published Puti Absoluta, the path of the absolute. Here he espoused the theoretical foundations of traditionalist philosophy. And he also founded institutions like the Arto Gaia Association, which is a publishing house and the center, and also the publishing house, as well as a center for meta strategic studies. Now, between 1991 and 1992, Dugan came closer to left-winged positions, and he connected to Gennady Zyuganov's Communist Party. Uh, and this coincided with a nostalgic re-evaluation of the Soviet period and with a tighter relation with left-winged neo-Eurasianism. Uh, he also became a fruitful publisher in the patriotic newspaper Dien, they later renamed Zavtra tomorrow. From 1993 to 1994, Dugan moved away from the communist spectrum and became the main ideologist for the new National Bolshevik Party, led by Eduard Limonov. Dugan started developing strong relations with the chief representatives of the European New Right, including Alain de Benoit, Robert Stoikers, Carlo Terracciano, Marco Battarra, and Claudio Muti. At the same time, some intellectuals with, uh, intellectual with more so-called democratic, quote-unquote, views like Popov, Stankevich, 
Ponomaryev attempted to initiate a democratizing process of Eurasianism. And moreover, at this time, other variants of neo-Eurasianism appeared, like those theorized by Lobov, Soskoviets, Baburin. And the intellectual activity of neo-Eurasianists increased thanks to various lectures and seminars on geopolitical issues and on Eurasian history held in schools and university, as well as through the publication of articles and translation of relevant essays. Now, the time span that covers the years 1991 to 1999 can be considered the period of maximum development of the uh, Dugenian neo-Eurasianist political theory. And here, Dugin published his main works, for instance, Misteri Evrazi, Mysteries of Eurasia, Giberboreskaya uh, Theoria, so Hyperborean Theory, Conspirologia, Conspirology, Metaphysica Blagoivesti, Pravoslavni Esoterism, Metaphysics of the Good News, Orthodox Esotericism, and especially, this is very important, As Novi Geopolitik. This is Foundations of Geopolitics, 1997, but also Conservativnaya Revoluzia, the Conservative Revolution, Templieri Proletariat, National Bolshevism e Iniziatia, Templars Knights of the Proletariat, National Bolshevism and Initiations. And especially among this book's foundations of geopolitics is considered a major study of international relations and appears also as the founding work of the Russian Contemporary School of Geopolitics. At the same time, the Agraf publishing house issued the main works of the founding fathers of Eurasianism, who we have already considered in previous videos, Trubetskoy, Bernatsky, Alexeyev, Savitsky. And unlike weaker versions of neo-Eurasianism, like for instance, the ones upheld by Panarin, Pashenko, Bagramov, Bulatov, and Girenok, Dugan managed to build what can be considered the orthodox neo-Eurasianist doctrine, based on even more radically anti-Western, anti-liberal, anti-globalist positions. Now, in the 1990s, some direct and indirect references to Eurasianism started to appear in the programs of the Communist Party, but also the Liberal Democratic Party and the New Democratic Russia Party, which respectively embodied the left, the center, and the right of Russia's political party spectrum. And between 1998 and 2000, Dugin began to strengthen his ties with the Russian parliament. He also managed to become advisor to the Duma speaker, Gennady Zelesnyov of the Communist Party. And in 1999, he also became chairman of the geopolitical section of the Duma's advisory council on national security dominated by Vladimir Zhirinovsky's Liberal Democratic Party. Now, again, between 1999 and 2004, Dugin published more books. For instance, Nashput, Our Path, which deals with the strategic, strategic development of uh, Russia in the 21st uh, century. Absolutnaya Rodina, Absolute Fatherland. Ruskaya Vesch, The Russian Thing. Yevrasistva, Teoria e Praktika, Theorian Theory and Practice. Philosophia Traditionalism. Philosophy of traditionalism, as novi Yevrasist, foundations of Eurasianism, uh, philosophia vaini, philosophy of war, and Yevrasiska misia Nur Sultan Nazarbayeva, the Eurasian mission of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. Also, along with numerous publications on newspapers like uh, Neva Neza Vizimaya Gazeta, independent newspaper, and Moskovsky Novosti. Moscow News. And here, Dugan held continuous also um, radio broadcasts on geopolitical issues and neo or neo Eurasianist topics from 1998 through to the early 2000s. Also, on the 21st of April 2001, the pan Russian political social movement Eurasia was founded with a declaration of full support to the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin. This is why sometimes it is said that Putin has been somewhat influenced by Dugin in shaping his political foreign policy, foreign policy uh, strategies. At the same time, exponents of the Muslim and Jewish world started to engage with the Eurasianist movement, 
for instance, the leader of the Center of Spiritual Management of the Russian Muslims, Sheikh al-Islam Talgat Tajuddin, decided to adhere to the Eurasianist ideology. And at the same time, for instance, a Jewish variant of Neo-Eurasianism appeared, especially thanks to Avigdor Yeskin, Avram Zhmulevich, and Vladimir Bukarsky. In 2002, the Constituent Congress of the Eurasia Political Party was convened in Moscow, and the foundation of the Eurasianist Party represented the apex of this movement's fate. Dugin became its leader, its programmatic charter was adopted, and also the members of its political council elected. In November 2003, the International Eurasianist Movement Congress was held. And in that occasion, the delegates decided to abolish the Eurasia political party, since the need for having a mere Russian political party was considered no longer sustainable for an international movement like the Eurasianist one. Thus, the party was abolished in favor of uh, its transformation into a broader international phenomenon. And in December 2003, the government of the Russian Federation officially recognized the international Eurasian movement, and its organization cells, which started to emerge in several countries, both of the post-Soviet space, but also uh, of the Europe and also on, in other continents. For instance, in Kazakhstan, Belarus, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Lebanon, Italy, Germany, Belgium, Great Britain, Spain, Serbia, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Canada, and the United States. And in December 2001, the Eurasia Party was officially disbanded. And from then on, the international Eurasian movement became the organizational structure of neo-Eurasianism under the um, auspices of Dugin. Uh, meanwhile, foundation of geopolitics as Novi Geopolitiki was translated into several uh, important languages, including Arabic and Serbian. And the conservative revolution in Russia was published in countries like Italy. Uh, and recently, we can say, so to conclude our uh, tracing, historical tracing of Dugin's works, recently uh, a publishing house known as Arctos uh, started translating some of Dugin's latest works into English. And these works include, for instance, the fourth political theory, 2012, Putin versus Putin, Vladimir Putin viewed from the right, 2014. Eurasian mission, an introduction to neo-Eurasianism, 2014. Last war of the world island, the geopolitics of contemporary Russia, 2015. The rise of the fourth political theory, 2017. And ethnos and society, 2018. We will stop here. Uh, we have analyzed today the core aspects of uh, the neo-Eurasianist doctrine from a theoretical point of view. And we have introduced the main uh, contributors and theorizers. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed this time spent in my channel. I wish you, of course, all the best. And I hope that we will see each other soon in our upcoming videos. Uh, the next videos will consider the liaison between geopolitics and Eurasianism. And here we will introduce some key aspects of geopolitics as a subject. And also we will introduce the main authors that contributed in the evolution of the geopolitical doctrine. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.